Should I go ahead and get started here? All right. Um, so I'm Suzanne Roberts. I'm one of the hand, upper extremity, and microsurgery surgeons over at Columbia University Medical Center. Um, so I treat kids uh, and adults uh, basically from the shoulder down. Uh, and that includes you know, congenital, trauma, um, anything in between, uh, overuse injuries, sports, et cetera. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about pediatric hand and upper extremity injuries. Um, so I don't have to tell you guys this is incredibly common. Uh, childhood injuries account for over 10 million ED and urgent care visits annually. 25% of those are musculoskeletal, and then another 10% are going to end up being fractures. Um, Two-thirds of boys and one-half of girls will have had a fracture by the age of 15, which is pretty incredible. Um, and then for uh, the boys, that peaks around 14, um, usually when they're having sort of a metaphyseal growth spurt. Um, and for girls, that peaks around 11 years old. Uh, upper extremity injuries actually account for over 50% of all of that. Um, the incidence is obviously going to increase with increasing mobility. The more they can stand and run around, the more they're going to fall down on their upper extremities. Um, mo most common is going to be your distal radius fractures. Um, and then this is something that that's, uh, we're seeing more and more. With increasing sports participation, we're going to see increasing injuries. So kids are playing more sports. They're playing year-round. They're playing harder than they ever were before. So that's why this is sort of an increasing situation. Um, and so I'm going to try and dispel what makes all these injuries so intimidating. Um, I think any pediatric musculoskeletal injury is intimidating, not only for you guys, but also you know, for us when we're learning. Um, for a number of reasons. Um, there's multiple ossification centers. So the elbow alone has six ossification centers that are ossifying at different rates. And not every kid is going to follow that growth curve. So that's really hard to figure out what is supposed to be there and what isn't. Um, there's also physeal injuries. Um, so if those are not recognized or if they're displaced and people make multiple reduction attempts, you can have uh, physeal arrest. Um, and that can cause gross discrepancies that will go on to need surgery, unfortunately. Um, torus fractures are easy to miss. Um, there's also situations where you're worried about, is this an abuse injury? Um, and then, you know, the, what's really frustrating is your patients can't always communicate with you that well. Um, so that, I'll teach you guys some, some tricks to sort of get the information you need from people who can't always tell you exactly what they, what they mean. Um, and then, you know, as, in any pediatric situation, you have uh, often two or three patients really more than just one. You get the parent and, and the child. <laughs> and that can also make things somewhat intimidating. Um, but the good news is that most of these injuries can be treated non-operatively. But you know, you're always wondering what degree of deformity is OK? What can be tolerated? What's going to remodel? And what needs a reduction today, tomorrow, uh, in the near future? Um, and what needs to be reduced or fixed, actually? Um, and then I want to sort of point out some of the most commonly missed or underestimated injuries that people really need to deal with more acutely. Uh, so I'll just start off really basic um, with your upper extremity exam for kids. Um, but again, because they can't always tell you everything that you want to hear from them, you're going to have to use some other tools, mostly inspection. Um, so if you see an upper extremity injury, you're going to obviously be looking for swelling. Or if you suspect an injury, you're going to be looking for swelling. Um, a big one is ecchymosis. So, you know, our adult patients are often on anticoagulation. Um, they're older, they're more frail. Kids don't usually bruise acutely um, unless there's a fracture because fractures bleed. Um, and so that's a good sign that there, there is more than just a sprain going on. Um, you want to look for lacerations. Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit less common in kids, but they do get tendon injuries. Um, so you want to, if you see a laceration over the volar side of the hand, you want to be thinking about what, in, what structures could be injured. Is there a digital nerve injury? Is there a flexor tendon injury over the back of the hand? You're going to be looking for extensor tendon injuries, things like that. Um, and then open fractures are always a little bit tricky. Um, so in the hand, we often don't treat open fractures as we would in the long bones. The hand is so well perfused, they often do fine with just irrigation and debridement, like a really you know, good irrigation and debridement. Um, closing up any wounds loosely so that they can drain, um, and then splinting appropriately. Uh, but you do want to keep an eye out for any of the long bone, the distal radius, or ulnar fractures, especially for those little poke holes. Um, they're you know, not just scrapes. They're a poke hole with like a darker bleeding coming from it. And those are the ones you want to send into the emergency room so that they can, can get um, irrigated and debrided acutely. Um, and then, obviously, you're looking for deformity. So that is more tricky than it sounds, again, as well. So 
Um, a big helper in kids is using tenodesis effect. So um, you can sort of flex and extend the wrist and look for any sort of discrepancies. Um, and that way you'll notice a lot of scissoring um, as they come into wrist extension and the fingers flex. Um, you'll notice the, the fingers will scissor over each other. Um, you can see some rotational uh, discrepancies when you extend. So you want to look at the nail. And if the nails don't sort of line up all the way across, you're going to be worried about a more rotational injury. And those are things that are not going to correct with uh, growth. So they need to come in and be seen and possibly pinned or fixed. Um, and then uh, the, uh, um, the great thing about orthopedics is um, there's two. So we get to compare to the contralateral side. If you're not sure, just look at the other one. Um, and then as far as your upper extremity exam, um, you, know, you guys know sort of where to feel for your median, radial, and ulnar distributions. And then you know, if there's any lacerations, you want to test the digital nerves. In an older child, you can do things like two-point discrimination with a paper clip. Just put it about a centimeter apart and see if they can feel that. Anything greater than 10 millimeters or a centimeter is uh, consistent with a digital nerve injury. So that obviously needs to be seen so we can repair it. Um, and then for motor, you know, you're, you're looking for your radial nerve, your EPL. Your median nerve is your FDS and FDP. And then your ulnar nerve is your um, dorsal interosseous. And a kid, that's really hard to get them to do. You have to kind of, you know, you have to kind of convince them. I need one good, good push from you, one good try. This is important, um, and you can usually do it. You know, if you if you give them that that encouraging talk, um, you can also try and use a game. So I often will say like, let's play rock paper scissors, and then say like, good job. Tell me I did a good job at the end. You know, so obviously your rock is your FDS and your FDP. Your paper is going to be your extensors, your radial nerve, and then your, your EPL is also your radial nerve. And then um, scissors is your ulnar nerve. <laughs> um, and then, again, you know, vascular injuries are not too common in uh, kids uh, because everything's so well perfused. But you can actually um, do an Allen's test. So you uh, will press down on the radial and the ulnar nerves, uh, sorry, radial and ulnar arteries, um, and let one go and make sure everything's perfused. Let the other one go, everything's perfused. You can actually do that for a finger as well for the digital arteries. Um, and then if you're really worried, uh, the like, little tiny Dopplers, you can Doppler the whole arch, and you can Doppler up into the fingers as well. So a quick question. Sure. If we suspect a nerve injury, like let's say there's a sensory deficit in one of the fingers, um, is that an emergency, or is that something that can be followed up next day? As long as the hand is perfused, um, it's not necessarily emergent. Um, so it should be seen you know, within the next few days so we can get them in to fix it. Um, but ner digital nerve injuries or you know, larger nerve injuries, you like to fix within two weeks if you can. Um, so you have a little bit of a leeway there. Uh, so in just kind of a crash course in pediatric radiology <laughs> and anatomy, uh, so obviously you have your uh, epiphysis, which is um, sort of past the growth plate there. Uh, the physis is the dark because it's car cartilage, so it's not calcified. Metaphysis is that uh, part just proximal to the uh, physis where it's a little bit wider. That bone is also sort of spongier and weaker, which is why you get a lot of injuries there. Uh, and then the diaphysis is uh, more proximal to that where you have your more tubular bone, and that's much harder. Um, and that's also where the, the uh, periosteum is extremely thick, and it's going to help you with a lot of the reductions and things like that. Um, and then, you know, torus fractures, again, easy to miss, but I, I find that they get picked up pretty easily. Um, so this is, of course, you know, immature bone can bow instead of break, uh, again, usually in the metaphysis where it's a little bit weaker. Um, and then in kids, the ligaments and tendons are actually much stronger than the bone, so that's why they're very prone to um, bone injuries uh, and, instead of sprains, where a lot of uh, adults will come in with that. Um, and these are actually stable fractures. So if you see this, you can put it in a removable brace and you know, say, just see the orthopedist you know, within a week or so. Um, no cast is necessary unless they're really in a lot of pain. Sometimes I'll cast the kids if they're extremely sort of protective and anxious about it. Um, but a vocal wrist brace is actually fine. Uh, and we don't have to keep following those radiographically. You get one x-ray, and then you're done. Um, and then just, you know, this is your classic sale sign uh, for an occult elbow fracture. You can get an anterior or a po uh, posterior fat pad sign. Um, and this is your presumed non-displaced elbow fracture. I would encourage you, if you don't have internal or external obliques, to get those when you see this, just to make sure. 
Um, and again, if you don't see anything there, then it's fine to put in a posterior elbow splint or a long arm cast. Um, but I wouldn't put them in a sling uh, because it's, it's, you know, you would gotta presume that that's a non-displaced fracture. I've definitely seen ones where even, you know, when I, they came in to see me, I couldn't find anything. And then when they came back, you know, I put them in a long arm cast and then three weeks later, I can actually see the non-displaced fracture. It started to move a little bit in the cast, which is still fine. Um, but if that had been in a sling, it could have been a different story. Uh, sorry to keep asking yeah. questions, but nope, this is means. our chance to kind of Yeah, by all means. Um, we've always been taught that that posterior fat pad equals, you know, a presumed supracondylar fracture. How often do you find that when you follow them up in you know a couple of weeks, that you see actual evidence of fracture. Um, I, I couldn't put a percentage on it, but I think that the risk of a um, oh, did I just go back too far? Um, I think the risk of a missed type two supracondylar is way too high. Um, I do get that get kids that come in that they were told it was a non-operative supracondylar, and it and it really isn't. Um, so the difference between a one and a two is subtle and it's important. We'll go over it. It's actually at the end. So I go from fingertip up here. <laughs> okay. um, but we will go over that. So that I think it's best to just be super cautious with those. Absolutely. Thank you. If, uh, <clears throat> regarding the obliques, if we're going to, based on seeing a fat pit. Regarding the obliques, if, if based on seeing a fat pit or our clinical impression, we're going to splint them with a long arm splint uh, and refer to ortho, then we could hold off on the obliques till they're seen by orthopedics uh, and... You could, you could. Um, change the management on our urgent care side is what I'm thinking so about. So I mean, there are, you know, you can have like a displaced lateral or medial uh, condyle fr fracture that didn't really show up on your initial x-rays uh, for whatever reason. Um, and if that's at all displaced, uh, then you may want to get them in sooner rather than later. But yeah, agreed, it's probably not going to be anything operative. So you don't, you don't have to get it. Great, thank you. Um, so now I'm just going to go over some more specific injuries, uh, sort of heading from the fingertip up. Um, so these are some of the common problematic hand fractures. Uh, so we'll just start off with a case. Uh, so this was an eight-year-old girl who actually just had a really high sort of princess bed that she fell out of trying to get a drink of water in the middle of the night. Um, and they, you know, took her to the urgent care. She had pain, you know, and difficulty moving the digit, and it was held in this sort of slightly extended position. Um, but all they saw was this kind of dinky fracture here, um, right on the side of the metacarpal head. So they you know, fracture, but you know, be, you know, be seen quickly. Um, but there's more going on here, actually. So if you look at the lateral, um, you can see it almost looks like that digit is lining up with a metacarpal, but it's the wrong metacarpal. So the long finger metacarpal is the most dorsal because the hand is an arch. Um, and so you see that index finger lining up with the long finger metacarpal head. So that looks, it looks in line, right? Wrong. That's the metacarpal it's supposed to be lining up with. So this was actually a metacarpophalangeal joint dislocation with a small fracture. Uh, but she was neurovascularly intact, it was fine to be splinted, um, and we just took her to the OR the next day. Um, so MP joint dislocations often get missed. Um, it's usually the thumb or the index finger in kids and from a hyperextension injury of some kind. Um, so simple uh, MP joint dislocations are a lot like PIP joint dislocations, which I think you guys probably feel pretty comfortable with. You just kind of pull some longitudinal traction, push the, you know, the distal portion the correct way, and it pops right in and is very stable. And that's also true of MP joint dislocations, but they have to be kind of reduced a little bit differently. Um, the reason being is that you have the, um, you have the soft tissue around the metacarpal phalangeal head. Um, and it can actually, if you, don't, if you pull just straight longitudinal traction, you can get it stuck and turn a simple dislocation where there's no soft tissue interposed in the joint into a complex dislocation, which won't reduce. Um, so really what you need to do is pull the finger up and over while you're pushing on volarly on the metacarpal head. And that'll sort of push it up and over without the soft tissue getting interposed. Um, if you're worried about that, you know, it's, it's not, you know, a, an emergency. It could wait and be sent to the emergency room or see someone the next day. Um, but you, I think you can feel comfortable doing those simple ones. If it doesn't reduce, then it is complex, and then you know it just needs to be sent to see someone. It's probably going to need surgery. There's something stuck in there. Um, and that was the case for her. So, you know, it didn't matter that she didn't get a reduction that night. It wasn't going to reduce anyway. Um, her whole volar plate was wrapped around the metacarpal head. Not, nothing was moving anywhere. <laughs> 
Um, so this is uh, her after her surgery. Obviously, if you look on the lateral again, that index finger looks like it's lining up with the metacarpal it's supposed to. Um, and then that uh, little chondral piece we fixed with a tiny little screw, and that'll just stay in and won't bother her. Um, so here's another case. Uh, so uh, this is an 11-year-old boy who presented after having jammed his finger catching a football. Um, and then on the AP, it doesn't look so bad, right? Uh, on, the la on the oblique, it looks a little bit worse. Obliques always look a little bit worse, right? And on the lateral, definitely something not right. Um, so this is your phalangeal neck fracture. Um, and these, again, are, I think are kind of like supracondylars. Um, it's, you know, if it's anything but a type one and it needs surgery, and then the difference between a type one and type two is kind of subtle, so um, I wouldn't underestimate these. Um, so these are extension and rotational injuries. Um, the border digits are most commonly affected, unfortunately for me, because the fingers are so tiny, uh, to get pins in. <laughs> and then um, really the key to this is getting a perfect lateral. If the condyles are not completely overlapped, then you really can't tell whether it's a one or a two, um, because the AP views will fool you as well. Um, and so the way that you sort of tell it's kind of like a supracondylar. You draw this line from the anterior portion of the diaphysis, and if the metacarpal, I mean, if the uh, phalangeal head is not crossing that line, then it's gone too far back and it's, it needs a pinning. It's unstable and it's not worth the risk. Um, the reason being is that this will block flexion, so they'll have, uh, you know, it won't be able to get into a fist, won't be able to have a tight, tight grip, and the growth plate is proximal, so it's not gonna remodel, unfortunately. Um, so this is this kid's surgery. So these need crossed pins. Um, to hold it in place. And as you can see, if I were to draw that line again up the sort of shaft of the uh, proximal phalanx, you would see that now that the, proximal, that the uh, phalangeal head does cross that line, which is where we want it, and he's got great motion now. Um, here's another case. So here's a 10-year-old boy who sustained a finger injury while he was playing capture the flag. Um, he was actually at camp. Um, he had some pain and difficulty moving the finger. Um, they took him to a little urgent care, like up by the, you know, up by the mountain or something. They saw this little fracture, uh, but he was moving the finger okay, couldn't make a complete fist, thought maybe that was a sprain or pain. And when he came home from camp, he again still couldn't make a fist. Um, and the reason wasn't because of a tiny little fracture, this is actually a jersey finger. So that little fracture is it's connected to the um, FDP tendon and it pulled proximally. So these can fool you. Sometimes you think maybe it's like a little volar plate avulsion fracture, uh, which is you know, basically a glorified PIP joint sprain. Um, if the little piece travels far enough proximally. Um, but if they're not making a fist, if they're not bending the, uh, the distal phalanx, then you gotta be worried about a jersey finger. And that has a timeline on it. Um, so, you know, we like to fix tendon injuries within two or three weeks. This kid came in six weeks, it wasn't repairable. Um, <clears throat> so, again, this is a forceful extension on a flexed finger. Um, and like, it, like I said, it fools you, the lumbar coals and the FDS are still working, so there is some finger motion, um, but they're unable to flex the DIP joint. Um, and in an acute situation, we can repair it, no problem. Uh, and then in a chronic situation, we have to do a staged reconstruction with a graft, and in a kid, that's, that's not a great uh, therapy situation. So is there a question in the back? Yeah, did you say um, that it was the kid's first child? Yeah. Uh, can you repeat it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, preferably, you know, within a week so that we can get them on the schedule as soon as possible. Um, the sooner these get fixed, the better they do. Um, so the, the physical therapy is, is very uh, sort of taxing, particularly on a kid. Um, so, you know, if they have to do the two-stage reconstruction, that's a really tough situation for a parent and a child to go through. Um, and so actually the, the best situation at six weeks is really just to excise the little bone piece so it's not blocking motion and, and let it go. They just won't bend the DIP joint again. It's not, not worth it at that point for a lot of families. Um, so this one uh, is, I think you guys have obviously heard about this Seymour fracture. So this is a displaced distal uh, phalangeal fracture with an overlying nail bed laceration. It's different from a mallet finger, which is, which is pictured here. So mallet fingers are okay. You can splint those, no problem. Um, what you're looking for here is that the, the um, physis and the metaphysis are completely heading in different directions, and you have a nail bed laceration. Um, usually a crush injury of some kind. 
Um, and this is technically an open fracture. So failure to recognize this um, will lead to not only nail plate deformity, which is unpleasant, um, but physeal rest and can be chronic osteomyelitis. Um, so that needs to go, I would say, that night or next day. Um, it needs irrigation debridement in the operating room. It needs to be reduced and pinned. And the nail plate removed, obviously, and the, and the nail bed repaired. Um, so carpal injury, scaphoid, very common. Um, so more subtle presentation than your distal radius. Um, these often will have a lot of bruising, though. So you know, it's nothing will show up on the initial x-ray, but there's a lot of bruising. That's your signal that something else is going on. Um, they'll have tenderness over the anatomic snuff box, uh, which I think you guys all know. It's right here at the base of the thumb. And then volarly over the scaphoid tubercle. And you can actually also like, uh, put some axial pressure on the thumb, and that will cause some uh, tenderness as well. Um, you wanna, if, you, if you're suspecting that, you want to obtain scaphoid views, but they're often negative initially. Um, so what I would recommend is putting these in a, like a good thumb spica splint, either you know, something you know, Velcro or, or one that you make, and then sending them to be seen that week. Um, so we'll often order an MRI if we don't see anything on the uh, x-ray, because that's the most sensitive, um, and, no, and much less of radiation. Most of these are going to heal, as long as they're recognized. Um, if it looks like there's any displacement at all, I'll be getting a CT and, and thinking about surgery. So there are some people that really say that if you can see a scaphoid fracture on x-ray, it is displaced to some degree, and you need the CT to really tell for sure. Um, the problem is, if they don't get recognized, the non-union rate, non rate is quite high. The reason being that the blood supply is retrograde, um, so the distal pole fractures are probably going to be okay if they get missed, um, but the waist fractures and the proximal pole fractures are not going to heal. So much like this patient. Uh, so this was a 17-year-old boy uh, who had a fall uh, playing basketball about three months ago. He actually fell onto both of his wrists, and both of the x-rays were negative. Um, but the left wrist kept bothering him. Um, so you know, he wore a wrist brace on both sides for a week. That's got to be uncomfortable. Uh, tossed them both <laughs> and continued playing basketball. Um, so he came in with you know, con you know, continued intermittent wrist pain. As you can see on the AP here, it looks like he's got a waist fracture that's got a big cavity. And if you look at the lateral of the CT, that cavity has actually completely folded the scaphoid over. So that's, that ain't going to heal. <laughs> um, so what this actually requires is some sort of grafting to stimulate healing um, and fixation, obviously. So, so for this, I actually take um, bone graft from the distal radius. Um, we take the metaphyseal bone and we, sh we shove that into the, the cavity and then use a piece of the cortical bone as a match stick to kind of prop it open. Um, and then I put the screw down. Um, they often, when you have this humpback deformity, they'll also have um, some carpal ligament uh, injury at that point. They'll start to get to some DZ deformity. And that's what the other pin is there to correct as well. Um, another one, you know, this is pretty, yeah. Did that patient have bruising? Uh, three months ago, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think they remembered. Um, so let's see. Uh, so paralunar dislocation, not super common in kids. It sounds like you know a lot of you are seeing maybe some of the older athletes, um, and and they can certainly have these. Um, but this is a rare and devastating injury, and, and it unbelievably gets missed 25% of the time, which is shocking. Um, it's usually higher energy, so usually sports or a motor vehicle accident, uh, which is why it's less common in little kids. Um, and then, you know, things you're looking for on the, on the x-ray, Galula's lines, you want to see those, those two little sort of smiley faces on the x-ray. Um, and then the lateral is going to be usually pretty obvious. Um, the lunate and the capitate and the metacarpal should all be in line. And as you can see on this lateral here, the capitate is in line with the distal radius, I'm sorry, the lunate is in line with the distal radius and the capitate is way behind it. Um, so what these actually need is an emergent uh, reduction and then they can be fixed uh, you know, within the next few days. Uh, depending on the injury, you know, if it's a trans scaphoid, then they usually just need to um, get the scaphoid fixed and the ligaments are intact. If all the bones are intact, then all the ligaments are usually toast and we need to pin all of that. Can you point out the capitate? Sure. So the, the lunate is here, obviously. And then the base of the capitates. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so the capitate is this, I mean, sorry, the lunate is the little moon-shaped bone here. And then the base of the capitate's way back here. And that should be where? On top of the lunate, yeah. 
which is why it seems crazy that they get missed so much, but they do. Um, just like in, you know, this one didn't get missed, but this, this kid thought he had a sprain. So he, you know, this is a 19 year old guy who was playing football um, with his buddies. Uh, he fell, it got pretty swollen. He must've been pretty tough because he didn't think he was in that much pain. Um, had some difficulty moving the wrist and he came in thinking he had a sprain, um, but he definitely did not. Um, so on the AP, you can see the scaphoid looks like it's not whole, right? And then the lunate, I'm not totally sure where that is, right? It looks a little bit kind of funny over here. So the scaphoid and the lunate went together. And when you look on the lateral, the scaphoid and the lunate are here and the capitate's back here. So this is a transscaphoid perilunate dislocation. He has a, a dislocation and a scaphoid fracture. Um, so this got acutely uh, reduced in the emergency room. Um, looks great now. So again, just to point out, so radius, lunate, Capitate all on top of each other. Would that be more obvious if you get a dedicated scaphoid view? You don't need scaphoid views for this, okay. yeah. Just okay. the AP and the lateral are, are fine. The lateral is usually a dead giveaway. Um, so capitate and lunate radius should all be in the same line. And then the transscaphoid part is, is not super important. It's just it's something for me surgically. Uh, but the dislocation does need to be addressed acutely. Um, so this could. Um, his scaphoid I fixed with the screw, and amazingly, uh, as is often the case in these, the ligaments were all intact, so I didn't have to put a bunch of pins in him, which is much better for his outcome in the end. Um, so now to the most common, uh, distal radius fractures, which are 40% of all uh, pediatric lawn bone fractures, uh, usually a fall in an outstretched hand, and metaphyseal injuries are the most common. Uh, Physeal injuries are the second most common, but way behind. Um, the, you know, some associated injuries you want to be looking out for is Galeazzi fractures. So that's a distal radius fracture of the distal third um, with a DRU, DRUJ injury. So the DRUJ, like you see in this picture, is way back up there. Um, and then, you know, these are the ones where you're thinking about your remodeling a lot. Um, so, you know, the closer you are to the physis, that's going to remodel well. Um, sagittal plane injuries in the, you know, close to the, digital, to the physis are going to remodel pretty well. Rotational injuries are not going to remodel so well. Um, and the way you can see that if you're not really sure clinically is you can get a forearm x-ray and the uh, radial styloid and the tuberosity should be heading 180 degrees from each other. Um, and then, of course, it's going to correlate to the amount of growth that they have left. Um, just sort of, sort of throw these together because we're going to talk about the remodeling a little bit. Um, forearm fractures, both bones, very common in kids as well. Usually more of like a fall from a height or a sporting event. Um, most commonly in the diap uh, sorry, in the distal metaphysis, again, because that bone is a little bit weaker. Um, and then associated fracture dislocations, you want to keep your eye out um, for an ulnar shaft fracture with a radiocapitellar dislocation. So ulnar shaft and then the radial head is, is either way up or way down. Um, and that's often why you want to get, you know, joint above and below and the long bone it's with your x-rays. So for both bones, skeletally mature patients, this is hands down a operative injury. Um, but for immature, skeletally immature patients, these can, most of these can be treated non-operatively. I will tell you that um, kids who are sort of physiologically adults, um, teenagers who, you know, have secondary signs of um, puberty, they are treated like adults, so that you know you want to either send them to the emergency room or to be seen quite urgently. Um, and then, if you're going to take a, a picture of a slide, this is the one. Uh, <laughs> keep this in your in your pocket. So, um, so kids less than nine years old, um, acceptable bayonetting is actually um, you can have up to one centimeter. I would say older. I really don't accept nearly as much, um, but you can be almost completely bayonet opposed. Um, and then acceptable angulations is 15 to 20 degrees for the both bones and, and then 30 degrees for your distal radius because it's closer to the growth plate. Um, kids older than nine, your, your sort of numbers go down and down. Um, so 20 degrees is by far the most I would accept for any, any distal radius. Go ahead. Specifically, do you mean by bayonetic overlap? Yeah, so I mean, it doesn't have to be direct overlap. It can just be sort of slid like this. Um, it doesn't have to be completely like that. Um, and also, there's a case coming up where you'll see. Um, and then as far as what, what these need, so if it's anywhere in the acceptable range, um, 
you know, we can leave these alone. If they're outside of the acceptable range, they need a closed reduction. And I, I would recommend sedations for their comfort. And, and it's hard to get a good reduction when they're fighting you and crying and the parents are upset. It's tough. Um, so, you know, if, it, if you think it needs reduction, I would, I would send it to get some sedation. Um, and then, I'll, you know, for all of these, even the distal radius fractures, I, you know, I trained at, at Boston Children's, so we put these in long arm bivalve casts. And long arm um, splint is fine, like a sugar tong. Um, or like a posterior slab with a sugar tongue is fine, but you have to control that pronation and supination in the early period or it can displace on you, um, even though it seems silly to put that whole thing on for a distal radius fracture. Um, and then you kind of want to you know, alert the par parents to any signs of compartment syndrome. Um, so they want to keep it elevated. They want to look for pain out of proportion. So they're, you're elevating, you're giving them some Tylenol, and they just sort of keep escalating. Um, they're talking about some, you know, some tingling more than you know, they did in the beginning, so it seems, starts to escalate. Um, again, just sort of educate them when they might need to come into the emergency room. Because uh, anytime you've done a manipulation, your chances of compartment syndrome do go up a little bit. Um, and then you know, kids that need an ORAF versus a pinning versus an IM rod, those are your unstable fractures, fractures that you couldn't really reduce well, or that when they came in for their follow-up, they fell off. They, they lost their reduction. Or of course, any open fractures, those need to be washed out and addressed. Um, so here's a, another case. This is an eight-year-old kid who, he just fell out of, you know, he was getting out of the car, but he tripped. <laughs> um, and then he was initial seen in an outside hospital. Um, he got reduced and splinted and placed in a sugar tongue. And that, it looks, that's a great reduction. So the, you know, the lateral looks awesome. And you know, for his age, he's, he's eight years old, so you know, there's about a you know, centimeter, that'll be fine if this stays, which it didn't, unfortunately. Um, so by the time he came in to see me, it's way off again. Uh, so that's unstable. Um, and just one thing I'll mention, so he had a, he had a history of a fracture of the same location uh, about a year ago, which is why I ended up doing the treatment that I did. Um, so this needs to be addressed, obviously. Your options would be you know, an IM rod or ORIF. Um, with an IM rod, you don't want to make multiple passes because um, that can you know, really escalate your chances of compartment syndrome. Um, so I went when, with the ORIF for this kid. Uh, and he's doing great. Um, so now we'll move on to the, the ones we're all worried about, right? The elbow fractures. Those are much harder. <laughs> harder for you, harder for us too. Um, so I'll just start off with the lateral condyle. So these are the second most common. We'll, we'll end up with supercondylars last because uh, I'm sure there'll be the most questions. Um, and these are typically in your younger kids. You really see these like around six years old and younger. After that, it's pretty uncommon. Um, and the tricky thing is, uh, you know, anything less than two millimeters of displacement, you're going to need an arthrogram to tell what the treatment is. Um, so those need to obviously be referred. Um, so less than two millimeters, they're okay in a long arm cast. Um, but anything between two to four, you're going to do that arthrogram to see if the cartilage hinges intact. And if it is, then you can just pin it. If it's not, then you need to open it up and make sure the joint looks great. Um, unfortunately, these tend to have a little bit less favorable outcomes. Um, so you want to refer them pretty quickly. They have more uh, chance of malunion or, and AVN as well. Um, so medial epicondyle fractures, thankfully, these tend to do a little bit better. Um, and I think they're a little bit more obvious to see sometimes, too. These are third most common, uh, a little bit older age range, 9 to 14. Um, usually with like a valgus stress and contraction of the flexion supernator mass uh, and the epicondyle, which is where the flexure supernator mass uh, originates, it pulls off. Um, so that's what pulls it all forward. This is actually a posterior structure and it's getting pulled forward. Um, these are often associated with a elbow dislocation in about 50% of cases. Um, and then you're going to look for ulnar nerve symptoms. Um, Often when I get in there, the ulnar nerve is just draped across the fracture site. Um, so they may not be completely up, but they're going to be complaining of a lot of nimbus and tingling in the small ring finger. Um, and then sometimes the displacement is tricky to assess, so we'll often get a CT for these. Um, some are more obvious than others, <laughs> as you'll see in, in one of our cases here. So um, for the classification and treatment, less than five millimeters of displacement is fine in a cast. Greater than five millimeters is going to need an ORIF. The um, gray area here is gymnasts, um, people who are sort of on their hands for their sport, gymnasts, at, um, baseball players, things like that. We're going to be a little bit more likely to treat those operatively. So I would refer them a little bit sooner. Um, and then a less common, but it's definitely something you need to be aware of, is uh, radial head and neck fractures. Most common around 9 or 10. It's really like a pretty narrow age range. 
Um, and it's, again, an extension and valgus force. Uh, again, often associated with uh, elbow dislocations um, and a medial epicondyle fracture, which is also uh, associated with dis dislocations. Um, often there's an electronon fracture as well associated. Um, and then for these, anything less than 30 degrees of angulation is gonna be okay in a cast. It'll remodel. Um, greater than 30 degrees angulation needs a closed reduction, and that can be tricky. Um, so I would send them into the ED for sure. Um, and then, you know, anything that didn't reduce, it didn't stay reduced, it needs to be pinned or, or fixed open. Um, sometimes these will actually be translated. I, you know, you may not even want to try uh, reducing that. You may just try and pin it because it's so far uh, over to the side. Um, another thing, you know, if you're not sure, you'll see blocks to pronation and supination, um, and that would that might clue you in that it's not quite lined up. But you want to see the um, the radial head should be pointing at the capitellum here. If it's not pointing at the capitellum, something's not right. And then our our old standby, supracondylar distal humerus fractures, most common elbow fractures in children, highest incidence around five to seven years old. 95% um, are the extension type, um, and then flexion type is by far less common, 5%, and those are usually pretty, uh, you know, pretty high energy mechanisms. Um, associated injuries, AIN is very common. Um, radial nerve palsy is uh, more common uh, with the, yeah, if the distal portion moves medially. Uh, ulnar nerve is more common with the, uh, ul with the uh, flexion type. Vascular compromise, uh, you know, depending on the degree of the supracondylar, is also pretty common. Um, and then, uh, interesting, there, there's often ipsilateral distal radius fractures. Um, so that's why these really require a good neurovascular exam. That's why I went over that with them. Because you, you, you want to be aware of any uh, of these um, nerve or vascular injuries early. Um, so for the extension types, there's uh, four types. And uh, really the most important thing for you guys to know is type one and type two. Type threes and type fours are probably not going into an urgent care. They probably have pretty obvious deformities. Um, but a type one is totally non-displaced. And that's okay in a long arm cast. I'd usually uh, cast or splint them a little bit um, more than, sorry, that's, that's heading the wrong way, uh, a little bit more than 90 degrees just to uh, prevent any swelling from causing any neurovascular compromise. Um, and then for these, you want to be aware of the medial comminution, and I'll show you that on another x-ray. Um, it may seem like a type 1, but if, it, it, if it's sort of crunched over to one side, that is actually going to be really a type 2, and it's going to lead to a cubitus varus deformity that will require an osteotomy later on. Um, so the type 2s are, are the ones that you're looking for. That's really any sagittal plane deformity with an intact posterior hinge. Um, so if it's, if it's tipped back at all, it needs to be pinned because it's going to keep heading that way. Um, and then the, the type threes is when you have sagittal and coronal displacement, so it's tipped back and then it's off to one side, usually medial, um, and that requires pinning or ORAF, depending on how bad it is. Most of these can be pinned. Um, and then the type four, you've got complete periosteal disruption. Um, again, these are pretty devastating injuries. They're going straight to the emergency room. They've, they've got other injuries. They're, they're part of a trauma. Um, and then, uh, so some of your, your markers that you're looking for, your anterior, anterior humeral line is your best friend. Um, so you just drop a line straight down the anterior portion of the humerus. And in a, uh, a younger kid, um, that can just touch the capitellum, that's okay. Uh, but anyone over than five, it really needs to be in that central third of the capitellum. If it's tipped back at all, you gotta be a little bit suspicious. Um, and this is the medial comminution that I was talking about. So this looks like pretty good. If we were to look at the lateral, I bet it would not be super suspicious. But this like crunch that you see, um, this is what you're looking for. And you can use Bauman's angle um, to, uh, to look at that. So you drop a line down uh, the sort of middle of the humerus, and then you're gonna draw another line along the, um, along the lateral, uh, physis, lateral, lateral condyle physis, um, and that should be around 70, 75 degrees. Any deviation from that you're worried about, it's, um, it's, there's a coronal plane deformity in either direction. And that's gonna hint at some instability that needs to be pinned. Um, so here, here's my last case for you. Um, so I have an 11 year old girl who presented to the ED after falling off a horse that got spooked and landed onto her right arm. So you can see the radial head is not lining up with the capitellum, and then the uh, olecranon fossa looks like there is not much going on in it, so we have an anterior dislocation there. Um, 
So she got sedation and she got reduced. Awesome job. Uh, looks great. Um, but there's something else there. There looks like there's something still in the joint, right? Now that, especially now that I've circled it in red, right? <laughs> um, so if you look at the AP, there is definitely something in the joint. And it's her medial epicondyle. It's right there. So that's pretty far displaced, definitely more than five. So that needs to be fixed. And it's not uncommon that these stay stuck in the joint. Um, right there it is. So this, she got a, a, a medial uh, epicondyle screw there. And she's, again, doing great. <laughs> so thank you guys for listening. And uh, thank you to the trampolines, uh, monkey bars, and bouncy houses of the world. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, so quick question. So regarding the supracondylar fractures, um, for the type 1s and type 2s, especially the type 2s, um, how quickly do they need to be referred to ortho? Um, I mean, I think, you know, if it's really, if you're in like a type 1, type 2 dilemma, I think you can kind of leave it to the family. So if they're like maxed out, we need to go home, we need to regroup and, and find someone tomorrow, that's fine. Um, but if they really want to get this dealt with tonight, I would send them straight into the emergency room. A lot of the peds hospitals have rooms open um, at night or early in the morning where they could just take care of this right away. Okay. So essentially within 24 hours you want them seen? Yeah. If, okay. you're, if you're in that kind of type 1, type 2 dilemma, I would try to get them seen in 24 hours. Okay. Thank you. Unless, unless you have any concerns about neurovascular compromise of any kind, then that should definitely go to the emergency room. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.